I better get started. I'm a minute into this. Okay, now, um, one other question set. Uh, how many rationalists are here today? Show of hands, rationalists. Okay, excellent. How many empiricists are here? Show of hands. Okay, we got one rationalist, two empiricists. Okay, we'll see why this is important in a second. Um, this is uh, the Menninger Clinic. I'm a little too loud, I think. I'm getting a little feedback. Uh, technical guys, uh, okay. All right. Uh, now you can't hear me, right? You can hear me okay? No, need a little more volume. Okay, how's that? Okay, so in the upper left-hand corner of this slide, you can see uh, some Menninger Clinic slides. So in the upper left-hand corner, those are the Menningers, the, the first three. You have in the middle, you have Charles Menninger. And then to the left of him, Will Menninger, his son. And then to the right of him, Carl Menninger. Or, or to the left of him, his left, is Carl Menninger, his other son. Charles Menninger started the Menninger Clinic. He, this was back in 1919. And he was a, a homeopathic physician who decided during his career that homeopathy doesn't work. So he switched to allopathic medicine kind of in mid-career. You know, you could do that in those days, you know. So they founded the Menninger Clinic, which had a pretty impressive bell tower, and it was in Topeka, Kansas. Um, and uh, that's the skyline of Topeka. And this is a photograph I took uh, in the lobby of the Menninger Clinic in Houston. And over on the left, you can see Carl Menninger, and then his son, uh, Charles Menninger, and then to the right of him, his son Carl, who had a son who was a psychiatrist named uh, Robert. And then to the right of him, Will Menninger, who had two sons who were psychiatrists, and they're Roy and Walt. And Walt still comes to Menninger sometimes for board meetings. I thought, how can you have like six psychiatrists in one family? I thought maybe they're like the Ramones, you know, they all changed their name to create a brand, but actually they were all related. <laughs> On the right is a stained glass window from the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. And in the lower right-hand corner, this is called the Healing Arts. And in the lower right-hand corner are the Menningers in stained glass. Because Menninger was synonymous with American psychiatry for a century. In 2003, Menninger moved to Houston, Texas to become affiliated with a medical school. And so they moved to Houston to become part of Baylor College of Medicine. And you can see the the skyline of Houston here, and this is the skyline of Texas Medical Center. So the Menninger Clinic is part of Texas Medical Center. And this is our new campus on Main Street, which is down the road a couple miles from Texas Medical Center. So personality disorders are uh, prevalent everywhere, and they are certainly prevalent in primary care. 20 to 30 percent of primary care patients have personality disorders. So one of the reasons why it's important for primary care doctors to know about personality disorders is because they cluster with depression and anxiety and other psychiatric disorders. So part one of this talk is how to think about personality. How much is nature and how much is nurture? Uh, where do I point this? Which way do I point it? Okay. So how much of personality is inherited? This is a journal that's off the beaten path. It's from Zagreb, Croatia, uh, psychological topics. But it is a really good article that addresses this question. I guess you could say that Topeka is off the beaten path as well. But they address this question in this article about half of what we call personality is inherited. Now, I asked in the beginning how many rationalists and how many empiricists here today, and only three people raised their hands. And this is important because the fundamental piece of information in Western civilization, you, you go out here and what do you see? Skyscrapers, you see jet aircraft, we have MRI machines. We, ha we now have cloaks of invisibility. All of this stuff happens because of Western civilization. Now, there are other great civilizations. 
Not to take anything away from them. And it's not like Western civilization arose on its own, you know, uninspired by Egypt, Babylon, China. But the reason we have all of these things is because the, of the way the Greeks figured out how to use the brain. This is a painting that I think you said you trained at University of Virginia. Did you ever go to Cabell Hall? This painting is in Cabell Hall, a reproduction of it that was painted in 1913. This painting was painted by Raphael Sanzio in the 14th century. It was commissioned by Pope Julius II. It's in the Papal Palace in Rome. So it's hard to see it in person, but you can. <clears throat> this is called the School, the School of Athens, and it was painted by Raphael Sanzio. And the Pope said, I want you to paint me a painting about Western civilization, Western thought. And so in the foreground of this painting, over here on the left, is the guy who Charles Freeman in the book The Greek Achievement said started Western civilization, Pythagoras, Pythagoras, the Pythagorean, the Pythagorean theory or theorem, okay? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Here is a really weird fact. That was about isosceles triangles, right? Okay, so he was a Sicilian Greek. Look at the picture of Sicily. It's an isosceles triangle. I mean, what are the chances, you know? In the very center of this painting are Plato and Aristotle. This is on purpose. Plato said, if you want to know about the world, the best way to understand the world is through reason, rationalism. On his right is his student Aristotle, who said, no, the best way to understand the world is to go out and observe. The, the word in Greek for experience is empiria, empiria. So empiricism is experience. Now we would say experimentation. Rationalism is reason. You, anyone remember trigonometry? You prove or disprove theories or theorems using reason. That's what we did in trigonometry. There was nothing empirical about trigonometry. Rationalism versus empiricism. Freud is on the left. Anyone want to guess what he was, rationalist or empiricist? Psychoanalytic theory, personality theory. Rationalist, absolutely. So he did everything in his head. On his right, anyone recognize that picture? Probably not. John B. Watson, a South Carolinian, a Southerner. Psychologist who said, I don't believe in a mind. The study of mind is the study of consciousness. Study of consciousness is the study of the soul. The study of the soul is religion. I actually agree with that. He said that there's no such thing as a mind because you can't show me a mind. If you can show me a mind, I'll believe in it. But you can't show me one, so I don't believe in it. There is only behavior. So he's the father of behaviorism. Rationalism, empiricism. When we talk about personalities, we're using rationalism. There's a lot of gravitational pull away from rationalism today, but it's not unscientific. It's very scientific. The mind is supposed to work rationally and empirically, the human mind, simultaneously. That's what created the miracles that we have today in technology. I needed to lay that groundwork so that you'll understand that we're going to be thinking rationally for the remainder of this talk, or most of it anyway. So what I've created is a systematic personality theory based on something that was taught to me by Dr. Everett Simmons, a psychiatrist at East Carolina University. The problem with personality discussion is that, and like in many areas of medicine, the study of personality is reigned over by experts in each individual personality disorder. So there's no field theory. So this is a way, a heuristic device to think about personality disorders. So, personality theory. Uh, significant personality pathology is frequently demonstrated to us by illogical thinking on the part of the patient, what we call primary process or very primitive reasoning. Specific personality disorders are characterized by specific ego defense mechanisms. Personality disorders probably originate in psychological lesions that happen at certain stages of psychological development. Freud discovers the unconscious when he's working with Charcot at the Salpetriere Hospital in 1885, studying the problem of hysteria. So you have these patients who have these really pronounced neurologic signs, uh, neurologic symptoms, but no signs. So they can't move from the waist down, but they have normal neurologic exam, good muscle tone, normal reflexes, uh, bowel and bladder control. So he says these people are absolutely convinced that they're paralyzed. 
However, there's no underlying disease. So he said the conscious mind is convinced that they have this disability, but the unconscious mind makes a decision to produce the symptom. So they're not aware that this is not a, an actual uh, physiologic disorder. This is a marker for the historical evolution of psychiatry. Freud's original model of the mind is you have the conscious in the middle. That's where logic is, reason, uh, ethics, surrounded by a diaphragm called the preconscious, which separates the conscious from the unconscious, the reptilian brain, the, the mind of rage, lust, fear, hunger. Now, if that diaphragm tore and all of that illogical, irrational material came crashing into the conscious, you would have torn diaphragm, or in Greek, schizophrenia. Now, this name does not describe this disorder, does it? We don't think of it this way. You know, they used to talk about the schizophrenogenic mother and so forth. Uh, in Japan, they changed the name of schizophrenia to integration disorder and were able to demonstrate a reduction in stigma associated with this name. But this just shows you the, the thinking at that time. So the unconscious is illogical. It's dedicated to wish fulfillment and drive satisfaction. That's its only ethical system. Okay, the structural model Freud came up with later and that's id, ego, superego. The ego has to protect itself from the superego, the id in the world. The id is the monster of rage, lust, and hunger. The world is a dangerous place. The superego is the demanding quest for perfection. So principles, ego defense mechanisms. Fixation means if a lesion happens at a certain stage of psychological development, that individual's coping style may um, recapitulate that, the coping styles of that age. Earlier lesions tend to be more devastating than later ones. So this is how we kind of empirically look at personality disorders. The cluster A's are the weird, the cluster B's are the wild, the cluster C's are the worried. This is just a, a device to think about them. And, and, and you see these columns are basically about temperament. So we see temperament through uh, the, the, the glass of the way that we classify personality disorders. So patients regress. So a borderline, for example, borderline patient under stress may become psychotic. And I, and I call that the left shift. Uh, we talk about left shift with the granulopoiesis, for example. You know, and I used to think, well, are bands always to the left of granulocytes, you know? but it's just a convention and you can see we can apply that to, to these personality disorders because on the left, on the right side, you have highly functional individuals, you have psychosis on the left, and then you know, the personality disorders are more or, less, more or less increasingly functional as you go toward the right. So developmental psychology, um, we're gonna use three theorists. We're gonna use Freud, Erickson, and Mahler to help us understand personality disorders. So Freud has these stages of psychosexual development um, contents of the underwear, <laughs> very well represented in his theoretical framework. Uh, then you have Eric Erickson, who I think correctly identified the fact that we have developmental milestones throughout life. You can see that he even has old age up there. Um, and uh, Eric Erickson, by the way, was not a physician. I don't think he even had an undergraduate degree. Uh, I think he had some credits toward a degree in art. But he obviously had a flair for this, you know? And then Margaret Mahler talks about the development of identity, separation and individuation. So ego defense mechanisms, we'll just look at a few of these. This is a catalog that's uh, not encyclopedic, but a catalog of ego defense mechanisms by George Vaillant from Kaplan and Sadek. Denial, we're all familiar with denial. Uh, most of us know about splitting. Um, These are the, the most primitive ego defense mechanisms. They're, he calls them narcissistic, even though narcissists don't really use those. Then there's the immature defenses, which are slightly more functional. We have schizoid fantasy, which we'll talk about a little bit. Somatization, I think everybody here probably knows that one. Um, and then these are slightly more functional. Uh, neurotic defenses, controlling, dissociation, rationalization, sexualization. 
And again, the more primitive the ego defense mechanism, the more, normal you, more normally you encounter it in, small, in younger individuals. And then the, as, they're, as they go up in complexity, they're more characteristic of, of people of uh, older children and so forth. These are the mature ego defense mechanisms. Uh, you know, and I, I was surprised to see asceticism in there, uh, altruism, anticipation, humor. Uh, as uh, speaking of humor, John Buckman, I don't know if anyone here ever met him, but he was uh, one of our beloved teachers at University of Virginia. This is the old campus, Blue Ridge Hospital, where I did the psychiatry part of my training. Uh, and he used to say, mature ego defense mechanisms are soluble in alcohol. And uh, alcohol will put you right into a left shift. You guys follow me? <laughs> OK. That was a, a beautiful place to work. OK, so now part two. We're going to talk about the specific characteristics of personality disorders, specific ones. So there's a new model for personality in DSM-5 that's more empirical. You can feel the gravitational pull of empiricism away from rationalism in the DSM-5. Nobody uses this yet. Um, but there's no longer an axis to. Now, these are going to be pictures to illustrate the specific personality characteristics. Uh, I'm a firm believer in the Goldwater Rule, which is a, a, an ethical principle of the American Psychiatric Association that you don't diagnose anyone that you have not personally examined. Uh, it comes from Barry Goldwater and the American Psychiatric Association. A lot of the members said that he was mentally ill and unfit to be president, and he sued him and actually won. So that's where the, the Goldwater rule comes from. So these are just to, to look at a public facade. So we're going to start with probably the sickest personality disorder, the schizotypal. They're very odd, very eccentric. I used a picture of Bjork here because she's wearing like a really weird dress there. And also because, um, because she's a foreigner, her speech is really strange and you can't understand it. And, and those are the two hallmarks of the schizotypal. They're, their peculiarities of speech and dress. I have no reason to think that she has schizotypal personality. But that is a weird dress. OK, so, <laughs> so these people, this must be a very early uh, disorder because uh, they don't have an ego. They don't have an ego defense mechanism. And the reason you can't understand what they're speaking is they're speaking in a, in a type of verbal hieroglyphics that they think you understand. So they actually borrow part of your ego for the purposes of communication. These are rare in any setting. Uh, they may have really odd ideas about what's causing whatever brought them to you. Their complaints can be very difficult to interpret. And um, your uh, desire to have uh, professional warmth toward your patient is going to bounce right off of them and may be misinterpreted. I don't know that I've ever seen a true, full schizotypal. I've seen people with those characteristics. Now, the schizoid, I've seen a number of these. They have an ego, but according to Heinz Kohut, they think their ego is so weak that they can't do intimacy. They're afraid that their ego will actually be replaced by another person in an intimate dyad. So. So they're very solitary and detached. They're not paranoid. They use an ego defense mechanism called schizoid fantasy. An ego requires validation from other people. They don't have relationships with other people. However, they need validation because they have an ego. And they get it two ways, pet dogs and schizoid fantasy. So they have these elaborate fantasy world that they know is it's not delusional that they live in that, that validates them where they're a cool guy and they have lots of money and everything. So Willard uh, illustrates th three things about schizoids. Relationship with animals, although it's usually not rats. Uh, odd, eccentric, kind of solitary, detached individual who, who nonetheless has a job. And they can function very well in occupations that are solitary, like night watchmen and so forth. So they're stuck in separation individuation proper of Margaret Mahler. Um, they're, they're not really symbiotic, but they are very autistic. And there's a lot of overlap with autism spectrum. Uh, there will be little bonding with the provider. Uh, their moods may be hard to read because they're so aloof. Now, paranoid personality disorder. This is uh, Edward Winter, Colonel Flagg. Anybody remember him from MASH? What are you talking about, comrade? And I, I think paranoia is at, at some level an adaptive human response to things. Uh, and then you've got Humphrey Bogart from the Kane Mutiny. 
they're distrustful and suspicious. And <clears throat> they may function relatively well in social and occupational settings until they get stressed, in which case they use the ego defense mechanism of projection. They project all the unconscious rage, lust, and hunger onto other people and become fearful of them. So this is straight out of Edward, Everett Simmons. They flunk trust versus mistrust. So the reason scams work on us is because we default to trust, but they default to, to mistrust and they never get taken in a scam, ever. Uh, so they're unusual, but I've had patients who are paranoid. Um, never try to convince them that their paranoid thinking is incorrect. It's not gonna work. And you have to be sincere with them because they can read insincerity through a cinder block wall. Okay, cluster B, paranoid, pers I mean, antisocial personality disorder. This is Robert De Niro in Cape Fear. He has the tattoo to tooth ratio that we used to talk about in psychiatry that, that is antisocial. However, you know, tattoos now are stylish, you know, so this doesn't work anymore. Disregard for the rights of others, deceitful. They operate on the pleasure principle, distortion, projective identification, rationalization. So I got interested in serial killers actually uh, back in 1976 when five bodies were found in my hometown. Uh, no one knew who they were. This is my father who was county medical examiner at that time. And this was the family of a guy named Bradford Bishop who used to work for the State Department. And he murdered his family and he's never been caught. They think he went to Europe and is hiding out there. Uh, so in the DSM-5 it says, Antisocial personalities disorders, also psychopathy. I disagree with that. I think psychopathy is a whole other thing. And I would refer you to a book called Anatomy of Evil by Michael Stone uh, that really gives you an idea what that is. And I think to say that antisocial personality disorder is psycho psychopathy, I think is a little bit unfair to them. Um, the antisocial has to camouflage his pathology in order to seduce and manipulate. Um, by the way, the Fonz is a scunizzo. Uh, this is a direct import from Naples uh, before World War II. The young Italian hoodlums who wore leather jackets, uh, they were called scunizzi. Um, so Hervey Cleckley, Medical College of Georgia, wrote this book called The Mask of Sanity about antisocial personality because they're not psychotic. They're not, they don't have, um, hallucinations or delusions, but they're capable of doing damaging things. Freud believed that the, um, the conscience was a, was a product of the Oedipus uh, conflict, the internalization of the father, and so there would have to be a failure there. And in fact, Michael Stone talks about one of the risk factors for antisocial personality disorders, absent father. Uh, Jonathan Shea uh, wrote about um, antisocial personality that Trauma can unmake personality, can unmake character. So guys went over to Vietnam who did not have antisocial personality, but they came back with it, and that's because of the repeated trauma that they came, that they were exposed to. One of my uh, good friends is a guy named John Cusack. He's not the actor one, but he's the psychiatrist one that I knew in Charleston, and we're still friends. Um, he wrote a book called The Mad and the Bad about his, um, his uh, experience working in the prison system in, in South Carolina, and he, he talks about, well, some are mad and some are bad, and they're actually different. Uh, his, he wrote this under the name John Hale, by the way, uh, because that's his mother's maiden name. He, the, the editor, the publisher said, we can't write, you know, John Cusack, you know, book. So he had to change the name. But anyway, it's a really good book. Pretty disturbing. Okay. <laughs> so um, the antisocial will try to create a toxic dyad with you in order to manipulate you. So if, if they can get personal with you, put you in a compromising position, it makes it difficult for you to not write them the Percocet and the Xanax that they would like. So you have to always keep that professional distance. And they, have a, they may need opioids and benzodiazepines, but you have to use them with extreme caution because these patients have difficulty tolerating frustration, difficulty with gratification delay. Borderline personality disorder, a lot of movies about it. Uh, fatal attraction, single white female, uh, girl interrupted. 
They have instability of self-image and personal relationships. It's a disturbance of identity. Their major ego defense mechanism is splitting. Um, this stems from their, splitting stems from their inability to see shades of gray. And, and this is a video of splitting in its native form. So here's a toddler. Let's see if this works. Tell me what you just said. I, I like you when you give me cookies. You like me when, when I give you cookies, but you don't like me all the time? Yeah, no. Why? But I like you only like you Again, get cookies so, from me. Oh, so only when I give you cookies do you like me? Yeah. Oh, okay, I love I, you. I, I love you too, but uh, uh, I don't like you all the time. Oh, okay, thanks. So this is when it's normal, is when they're small children. And, and so when you see this in your practice, yes, when you give them the Percocet or the Xanax, you're the greatest person who ever lived. But the minute you say, oh, we got to take you off of this, you are now an evil bastard. So, <laughs> so borderline personality disorder comes from the stage of psychological development called rapprochement. When the child is getting away from mother and going and playing and then gets startled and goes, where's mom? And goes back and loves on mom and then develops the courage. Mom supports the separation individuation. If a lesion happens there, such as sexual trauma, God forbid, then uh, the individual has uh, that level of coping and thenceforth. And notice that they don't have, they don't get to object constancy. And there's a, there's a, a huge bulk of literature about borderline patients being admitted to inpatient units with transitional objects, teddy bears, for example. A whole lot, I've seen this, you know, many, many times. So like the antisocial, they have to camouflage their pathology and may seem to be very well put together when you first meet them. But then as, as you kind of take responsibility for them, they begin to regress and become completely unmanageable. So it's uh, relatively common and it has a lot of comorbidity. So the main thing about them, just like with the antisocial, is a professional caring but the professionalism gives you the distance. You don't want to contaminate the transference with anything personal if you can avoid it. We, call, we talk about iatrogenic or nosocomial regression. When borderline patients are admitted to the hospital and they stay there too long, they can actually get worse over time. Narcissism. There's a movie called Pumping Iron. You can see Arnold Schwarzenegger, who I do not believe is a narcissist, but could be, using the ego defense mechanism of devaluing. The narcissist is someone who has a lot of self-doubt. That's why they're narcissists. They create a mask of, of achievement, uh, but they have a tremendous amount of self-doubt. And one way they deal with that is they become experts at making other people feel insecure about themselves. So that's called devaluing. And in this movie, you can see how he sees Lou Ferrigno come in. I mean, Lou Ferrigno, the Hulk. He walked, he's six foot five, you know, gigantic human being. Schwarzenegger immediately recognizes him as the primary threat to the Mr. Olympia contest and starts working him, makes him insecure about himself and goes on to win uh, the Mr. Olympia contest. Heinz Kohut is the main author of uh, analysis of the self um, about uh, narcissism. And he says it's a failure of empathic parenting. The theory is that if parents love us only when we do good, but not when we don't, then the individual has a lot of self-doubt and, and may be narcissistic. So the, their haughtiness and self-adoration is a facade. It's important to remember that. You can accidentally insult them sometimes because they have a brittle self-image. Um, the, the main thing to know about them is they may idealize you initially and they may devalue you later. And that's the hard part of narcissism is weathering that devaluation. If you do that though, they will be very grateful to you. If you don't respond in kind, if they start telling you how terrible you are and stuff and, and you kind of keep your composure, they're very grateful later on that you didn't respond to them. Now, histrionic personality disorder. This is Wilhelm Reich. He's the first guy who wrote a lot about per histrionic personality disorder. Uh, I think part of the reason this is kind of a vague diagnosis is because not only that haircut, but this guy <laughs> was a true strangeoid. Uh, he believed in something called the orgone, and he had these machines that were orgone machines, and actually went to jail because the FDA told him to stop selling these damn things, but he wouldn't do it. 
So anyway, he, I think he had sex with a lot of his patients, you know. Woody Allen actually uh, riffed on him in the movie Sleeper. Anybody see Sleeper? Remember the orgasmatron? Wilhelm Reich. Okay. <laughs> You know, but at least, like, like every other dangerous thing in nature, he has this, this haircut that warns us, you know, stay away. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm using the mature ego defense mechanism of humor. Okay, so <clears throat> he talked about coquetry, seductiveness, and that's the hallmark of the histrionic personality. Um, and one theory about them is that they win the Oedipus conflict by default. And they're not all female, they're, they're male histrionics, but for the female ones, they think of maturity as being sort of, they're at the Barbie doll stage. Their, their major ego defense mechanism is somatization because that's the ego defense mechanism that children use in the Oedipal stage. Stomach hurts, headache. Now in that picture I showed you earlier, Plato is holding a book. And if you look closely, the name of that book is the Timaeus. In the book, The Timaeus, Plato says, the womb is an animal which longs to generate children. If it remains barren too long after puberty, it strays about in the body, choking off the passages of the respiration, provoking the sufferer to the extremest of anguish and causing all other manner of symptoms besides. Hysteria, the wandering uterus. Uh, one of uh, Hippocrates' six psychiatric diagnoses. So that's somatization. So avoidant personality. We're going to cluster C now. Cowardly lion. What was he afraid of? He's a lion. He can kill winged monkeys with no trouble, you know. Blood everywhere. He was afraid of his own anger. He was afraid what would happen if he got truly pissed. And so that's the thing about the avoidant. They're afraid of their own rage and lust primarily. So they have social inhibition, feelings of inadequacy, and they're stuck in the latency stage of Freud. Right, right in that period of time, when children become sort of cooperative and are sexually latent. Um, this is the stage of 40-year-old um, virgin. Remember that movie? Very avoidant individual. There's a school of psychotherapy for avoidance, Habib Davenu School. I'm formally trained in this, the broad focus short-term psychodynamic psychotherapy where you mobilize the patient's rage in the office setting and show them that it's safe. Not the lust, though. Okay, so <laughs> there's specific therapy for them, and because they look a lot like social anxiety disorder, they may respond to the medications we use for that. The dependent is someone who will do anything to stay in a relationship, including, I think, sometimes endure abuse. Uh, we call that introjection. Um, I think this is probably from Erickson's ego identity versus role confusion. The lesion happens there. Um, I, I do not mean to pathologize the victims of abuse. People get abused because they're with someone who is a bad person. I think it would be kind of abuse, though, to not identify and try to work on any sort of predisposing factor, which could be dependent personality. We usually encounter them when they're suicidal after a breakup. So now we're at obsessive compulsive orderliness, perfection, control issues, so preoccupied with lists and details that the primary point of the activity is lost. Well, I had a primary care clinic when I was in Charleston. I had a patient in there who had the most meticulous records of terrible glycemic control I had ever seen. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, what? I, you know, I said, why, why is your blood sugar control so bad? And he went, I don't know, you know, perfect. Uh, he had videotaped every skater, you know, he was into skating and he had like a whole room full of videos that he made of, of ice skaters. So isolation of affect, Spock, refuse to show emotion or tries to control emotion, lack of spontaneity, punctiliousness, fastidious, Tony Randall and the odd couple, remember? Um, controlling is one of their major ego defense mechanisms. Now, we say they're at the anal stage, you know, um, because that's when children learn control. They learn that, hey, if I don't poop, Mom flips out. So they can, now they can manipulate the environment, you know. Now, if mom says, all right, I'm going to give you an enema, <laughs> we may have control issues, you know, from then on. So these people are impressed by thoroughness. In my professionals program at Menninger, uh, I have doctors, lawyers, I have uh, uh, CEOs. Many of them are very obsessive compulsive. And 
we lock horns a lot about control over their treatment and it can be very difficult. Sometimes we can channel their obsessive compulsiveness into getting better, sometimes we can't because it becomes a control issue throughout. So, do we have time for the role play? We do? Okay. All right, I need a volunteer. If no one volunteers, I'm going to pick a volunteer. So this will be, um, Mandy Stone told me that we could download this, people could download this off the internet. So, um, yeah, sure. Okay, I nominate you, sir. <laughs> That's what you get for being in attentive, I'm punishing you. It will be a parting gift for you. <laughs> Okay, so you're the physician. Yes, uh -huh. you're the physician, and uh, I'm the patient. A patient's a 45-year-old male with high blood pressure and hepatitis C, but his last visit to, our, visit to our clinic was about 18 months ago, at which time he had moved to another city. He returns complaining of back and knee pain. Okay, okay. Mr. Williams, how can I help you today? Well, Doc, it's my back. Do you mind if I call you Albert? Uh, and don't call me Mr. Williams, that's my dad. Call me Tommy. Anyway, I got bad discs, L3 through L5, and my knees are shot. Dr. Webster, he was my orthopedic up in Greenville. He says my knees was just bone on bone. Uh, he said it was a miracle I could walk at all. He was giving me lore tabs and volumes and Tylenol number three for breakthrough pain. He had me on Percocets, but I had him get me off of them because they're addictive. <laughs> Oh, slow down a minute. <laughs> uh, now I notice your blood pressure is quite elevated today. Was anyone treating your blood pressure in Greenville? They had me on HCTZ. When I'm in pain, though, my blood pressure goes up, and I bet yours does, too. I got in a car crash Monday, and my pills was all over Highway 20. My wife is still in the hospital in Springfield. <laughs> Damn highway patrol guy, Everton was his name, and I got his badge number. He wrote in his report it was a single car accident, but that's a damn lie. He didn't do his job. He didn't talk to the witnesses, and I, I must have seen a dozen of them. The other guy just drove away. Anyway, I got a call into the State Department Highway Patrol. I'm going to talk to his supervisor. Is your wife all right? Well, she's got a broken leg, but she'll be okay. But I'm not surprised you asked because I heard that that's the kind of doctor you are. Everyone around here says you're the smartest, most compassionate doctor in the county. They say you really care about your patients, and I can tell that about you in just the few minutes we've been together here. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, well, thank you. Thank you very much. It's hard to maintain that doctor-patient relationship nowadays, but I try as hard as I can. I have always believed in the importance of good communication, and that's what... They taught me in medical school. So he needs to ring a no sale sign up for that compliment I just gave him. So I, I set a trap for you just then. Okay. Um, at least you're not like that Simmons son of a bitch who used to work here. He didn't care one bit about people. A man like that ought not to be in the medical field. I have never in my life been treated like that man treated me. He wouldn't give me cookies, right? Uh, if I hadn't heard he left, I never would have come here. Well, he may have had some communication problems, and he could be a little difficult to work with once, once in a great while. What medicines do you take besides the pain medication? And so there's another trap I set for him. Uh, well, they got me on Cymbalta and that blood pressure medicine. Cymbalta is for depression. Do you have depression? Yeah, and you would too if you was me. I can't work with all this pain, and I've been turned down for disability twice. And the other thing is, hey, Everything I say here is confidential, right? Uh, of course. Trap number three. Well, I got a criminal record going back a few years. I made some mistakes, sure, but mostly it was being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Armed robbery, possession with intent to distribute, <laughs> criminal domestic violence, and such as that. But I've paid my debt to society, but my parole officer won't get off my ass, and I, go pl I plan to go kill that son of a bitch. First chance I get. <laughs> Anyway, when you apply for a job, you got to answer on there, have you ever been convicted of a crime? And of course, I tell the truth. One thing I will not do is lie. And when they see on there you committed a crime, ain't no one going to hire you. So are you planning to kill your parole officer? That's right. 
I got to take those piss tests and one came back positive and I got in big trouble and he lied on me, man. You know my urine's going to be positive with the meds I take. And I explained all that, but he wouldn't listen and I had to go back to jail for three months. Are you having serious thoughts about harming someone? You will need to see a psychiatrist. Now, you said everything I said in here was confidential. Are you telling me that was a lie? Well, no. Look, I got to get my pain medication. I've been without them for two days, and I'm losing my mind from the pain. You just can't understand what it feels like. Do you have the bottles with you? No, like I said, I lost them in the accident. And I don't need the Cymbalta or the HCTZ. I got plenty of that. <laughs> Perhaps you, you could give me the number to the pharmacy so I can call and make sure that the prescriptions are active. Are you saying you don't trust me? Doesn't there have to be trust between the doctor and patient? I mean, if you ain't got trust, you ain't got jack. Well, if I can verify these are active prescriptions, I can't very well prescribe them. These are controlled narcotics. I, I have to have rules about the way I do things. So that's, that's an error there, you know, taking personal responsibility for a decision that's kind of out of your hands, you know. Fine, fine, keep your medications. You're just like that other quack who is here who wouldn't give me cookies. What kind of doctor lets a man suffer this way? That's all I got to say. I guess I'll just have to start drinking again because that's the only way I can keep the pain back. I just hope I don't kill anybody driving drunk. Externalization. Are you saying you have a problem with alcohol? Because if so, I can arrange for you to get treatment. I hate liquor. I can't stand the taste. I guess you're just not listening. Like I said, I have to drink to keep the pain away. This is no way to live. I might as well just go out there and end it all. If I have to live in all this pain, I'd rather not be alive. And so patient exits. So this will be, Mandy told me that you could download this from the website. It has footnotes of all the traps that I set for Albert uh, in that interaction and uh, ways to be aware. Like, like when, when they give you that compliment about who you're the best doctor ever, you go, ah. And when somebody else, uh, how terrible they are, you go, ah, you know. So you don't ring up a sale sign on those because then they use that to manipulate later. Anyway, uh, I don't know that we have any time for questions. So yes, we do. We do? Okay. We do. Oh, we do. Yes, we do. Okay. We do. Any questions, folks? I have a question about what your responsibility is to, um, to report that man after he storms out of your office. Um, he says he's going to kill his parole officer. What do you do? Well, I think you do have to... You, well, so this is a real-life problem. He says he's going to kill his parole officer, but you probably don't know who that is. So um, in Texas, for example, where I live, there is no duty to warn. In fact, duty to warn is a breach of confidentiality in Texas. Texas has a lot of sort of unique laws, you know. Uh, yeah, in fact, when, when you go to practice in Texas, anybody here from Texas? You have to take the exam. You have to take an exam to get a license to practice in medicine because things are very different there. Like it's illegal to do ECT on anyone under 15 or something. But in Texas, so, so the main thing you have to know is what the standards are in your community and what the, the rules are in your community, the laws. So like I said, in Texas, we, we don't have a duty to warn. Uh, now, if, uh, so, so he said two things you have to worry about. Number one, that he's going to kill himself. And number two, that he's going to kill his probation officer. You know, and so I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, I hope he, he does it in that order, you know. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> but the, the important thing to remember is that um, you have to do what you reasonably can do. And so if you, if you make a call to, um, I don't know who it would be. What I would do is I would try to find out if there is a number where a number of parole officers can be contacted and just make an effort to contact one of them. Uh, and then as far as he goes, um, you, you may um, either have police do a well check on him or actually have the police go looking for the guy uh, because he said he was going to kill himself. You know? And it's a mistake not to act on that even when you know it's just a bluff. You have to treat him as it's serious. And antisocials actually, which this patient is fairly antisocial, um, they do have high suicide rates, so higher than average. Do you tell the patient you're going to do this? Yes. Well, and so that was one of the traps he set for 
uh, for the provider. He said, everything I say in here is confidential, right? You never say yes to that. You list the exceptions to confidentiality. And that way, there's no misunderstanding. Those are, those exceptions are. In most places, it's if you tell me that you're seriously thinking of harming yourself, that is not protected information. If you tell me that you're seriously thinking of harming someone else, that is not protected information. If you think that, if you tell me that you're abusing uh, an, an elderly person, a child, or a vulnerable adult, then that's not protected and the chart can be subpoenaed. So that's, that's what I tell them whenever they say, is this confidential? I had a guy in uh, Salem, Virginia one time. I suspect he was a serial killer. He said to me, now everything I say in here is confidential, right? And I said, I listed those exceptions and he went, okay, never mind. <laughs> I think he was actually a serial killer. Yes. Boy, that is a interesting microphone. Do you have links to possible suggestions as to how to handle that encounter? Because I've had that encounter more than once. Um, <laughs> so and what do you do? Well, if you download the, um, the uh, I'll go ahead and give you this, one of the copies I have. It, um, it has footnotes that uh, give you a little bit of advice on how to deal with all the specific traps that the patient set for you. So there's about a page of footnotes that go with that. So uh, I think definitely uh, download that. I think, you know, one of the big mistakes that was made was, was thanking the patient for idealization. The patient's idealizing me, and to, and to thank him for that is giving him permission to take it further. So what you do is you say, well, thanks. That's appreciated. Or as my brother Joey would say, preach. <laughs> and then... Uh, <laughs> And then, you know, when they talk about how bad another provider is, you also have to be kind of non-committal. You know, sometimes I'll say something like, well, you know, it's chemistry. It's chemistry between people, you know. They'll try to get me into playing into the split, you know. And that's what that is, a split. So you don't play into the split. You just go, all right, well. Now, if they tell you that they had sex with that provider, that's different. You know, then you're like, uh... I, you know, I, you need to go to the board, but, uh, but anything like, we're, like this guy saying, he won't give me cookies, I mean, you're just like, well, that's too bad, you know? I have one quick question. In general, for some of these personality disorders, is psychotherapy much more important than pharmacotherapy? Well, uh, yes, absolutely. There, you know, borderline personality disorder, which we think of as being very uh, morbid, uh, there are, you know, DBT is a very good um, treatment for them. They do very well with it. Uh, Marsha Lanahan, who came up with it, at, she's at uh, University of Washington in Seattle. I actually had one of her patients. We talked on the phone quite a bit, you know. And my <laughs> wife, who's here, she was like, you're talking to Marsha Lanahan on the phone? That's who you're talking to, you know? <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, it's a very, very effective uh, therapy for uh, Borderline patients. Now, antisocial patients, no psychotherapy helps them and probably makes them worse. They love it because it helps them to, to, to sharpen their skills. Uh, this is not a universally held opinion. Some people think that there are schools of psychotherapy that help them, but I, I personally would not engage in that. Um, uh, so, like I, I mentioned, avoidant personality disorder, the Dad and Lou technique. So, psychotherapy is generally uh, very effective. There's a lot of thought about medications. We know that Topamax, and we'll see this in one of my later talks, does help borderline patients with their mood instability. Topamax. I saw a question over here. Yes. What do you do with patients that you discuss or try to redirect them several times and want to call you by your first name? Um, I have a patient, actually, I have two women that come in, and they're elderly. Well, there's not a whole lot you can do. Uh, the best way to deal with that is to go, is to let them call you whatever they want to call you, you know, as long as it's not something, you know, bad. <laughs> and, and, but continue to call them Mr. or Ms. Yes, 
Yeah, so that way you maintain that professional distance. You know, you can't win an, a power struggle over whether or not they want to call you by your first name. Uh, that risks introducing a toxicity into the relationship. So. <laughs> Cookies, man. It's that cookie thing. Yes, sir. Without being too political, the world is so different now than it was years ago. Where, where would you, or what personality disorder would you place on some of our leaders in this country? <laughs> Thank you. Even though, even though you haven't examined, you haven't examined them, and I know you can't say, but you've seen enough to know. Here's what I would say about that. There are psychiatrists and psychologists now who are taking a stand on certain politicians, let us say. Um, I, my perspective on that is twofold. Number one, they are using stigma. I don't like that. I believe that to be a good politician, you almost have to have a personality disorder. I mean, you know, think about it. Um, like. John Ronson, who wrote The Psychopath Test, I met him at CrimeCon last year, excellent dude. He, he also wrote uh, Men Who Stare at Goats. He said that to be a great executive in, in corporate America, you have to be at least almost syndromally antisocial. You have to make decisions that you don't fret over you know, for years to come. So, so I think it's... it's it's, it's inappropriate. I think if you think someone's a jerk, you know, being a jerk is not a personality disorder, and you can say they're a jerk, you know. So, so I don't like that they're using stigma. I think, you know, Abraham Lincoln had severe bouts of depression. I think you can be a gifted leader and have a psychiatric diagnosis. Why not, you know? Yeah, I mean, narcissism, for example. I mean, you know, so, so, you can be a really cool person and have a personality disorder. You can be good at what you do. I think the main thing is, you know, get treatment, you know, get work on it. But, but I think many of them, like, they can be adaptive in certain circumstances. 